I got support as a teacher, and that's rare. Uh, you know, my first four years teaching, I was suffering in the classroom, and I didn't feel supported, and I wanted to quit a lot, a lot of days. Um, and you know, I'm sure, like many of you, if you're teaching in Pomona, I taught in Northeast Los Angeles, but it's a similar community. You know, it's really low income, and the majority of the parents don't speak English, and my Spanish isn't very good, and. You know, so there were a lot of challenges of just kind of connecting with my community, but it was a community that I grew up in, so I had that. At least, you know, I wasn't like this random white dude. At least I was like, oh, you're that, you're that one white dude that grew up here. You know? <laughs> so at least there's that. But um, and so I could connect with my students, and I love my students, and, and I do love teachers too because I know that you love your students also. Um, and so thank you for what you do, honestly. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about task design. I, there's a lot of things that we can talk about when it comes to equity, um, and I know there are people that are much better than me at talking about issues of race and class and culture. I'm not the best at that, I'm trying to get better at that, but I don't feel like I could come here and teach you all about that. You probably could teach me. So this is me, I've been on Twitter for a while. Um, as a lurker, I peek into this, this MitBoss hashtag, and this I teach math hashtag, if you just type that into the Google search bar, it'll come up with lesson ideas and activities. Like these, these are people, all math teachers, the only math teachers are doing that, um, sharing their practice and sharing like what they did that day and what activities they have. I just hope that some of the resources I share with you will spark some curiosity and you'll continue to look for more in the future. You can always talk to me. I want you to reach out to me. So. Um, my email is evan.rushkin at gmail.com. I'm a math coach. So how do I connect with each of my students? And they all are so varied in their interests. Like that's not an easy problem to solve. And there's some people that have dedicated their lives to trying to solve that problem. So instead of me banging my head, let me take what they've done and see if it works for me. Like how do I get my students engaged? And then now I've been reading recently uh, this, uh, a book by Jay Gillen at the Baltimore Algebra Project and it's talking about educating for insurgency. So they raise their students to, to fight against the system. And it's interesting, he talks about the word motivation and engagement, and he, he, tells, he tells it from a different perspective. From the student's perspective, I am motivated. I am engaged with what I want to do, not with what you're telling me to do. Excuse me, what did you say the author's name was again? Oh, Jay Gillen. Uh, Jay Gillen's from the Baltimore Algebra Project. Um, he's part of that big clan of folks. Um, Bob Moses, of course, has written many books on the subject of uh, basically math education is an act of social justice. So they write on that and you know, a lot more knowledge than me. Um, here are some things, if you want to tweet anything from my top, you know, you could uh, put one of these hashtags on your tweet. Um, those are the most popular math education um, hashtags. So they get like 100, 200 a day uh, tweets on these. So this is an elementary problem because I knew that the majority were elementary and it's from Magdalene Lampert's book, um, Teaching with Problems. And um, so we're gonna start by just looking at this, write this down in your book. There's, there's really no necessarily question yet. Um, I just want folks to write that down, think about it, and then share with us, raise your hand if you have a question about this, this task. This is gonna be a task. But right now, it's just got some boxes. Sure, calculator is fine. Um, and, and before you start calculating, uh, I just want some questions. I'm just gonna, oopsie, All right, here we go. I just wanted to take down some questions. So folks have questions about this task, right? Because I haven't really put, in, I just have subtract. It says subtract, but yes. Is it two digits minus two digits? Is it two digits? Minus two digits. Other other questions that came to your mind when you saw this, because this kind of goes back to yesterday we had Young talking about transparency. Sometimes we put problems up that it's like, wait, what exactly are you asking me to do? Uh, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to fill in or choose our own numbers that work? Okay, so I heard. Do you want us to choose numbers, fill in? Other questions, yeah? Are the digits gonna be the same? Are the digits gonna be the same? Yeah? Will students be borrowing? 
Will students be borrowing? Yeah. Can you repeat the digits? Can you repeat digits? Any other questions? Oh, sure. Can we use negative numbers? Can we use negative numbers? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions before we start the test? Notice like the instructions aren't super clear. There's a lot of questions already, right? Yeah. Oh, what are the digits on the side? Oh yeah. So what are the digits on the side? That's actually off the slide, right? This is this is like in case I wanted to show you an example once I explain it. But yeah, now that you pointed it out, thank you. Um, the digits on the side are an example, so as people noted, what we're going to be doing is filling in right, with digits that make the subtraction problem work. Right? So we're going to be filling in with digits that make the subtraction problem work. And I, I gave my best attempt at those instructions. Oh, that's not the button I want to press. Um, and I, I don't know if those instructions are correct. I said, how many combinations can you make if you use the digits 0 to 9 to fill in 10s and 1s? Um, I don't know if that's clear enough, right? I, I'm hoping that that doesn't say you can use negative numbers. They're not super clear. Our students will take it wherever their mind takes it, right? So it might not be where we expect it. But that's my expectation right now. Let's try this task. So let's try to figure out how many combinations we can make using the digits 0 to 9 to fill in this, the tens in the one place in these boxes. Now before I just let you off, are there any qu clarifying questions still? Because it still may not be clear. Are you using the digits once only? Um, so good, good question, like is it, does it have the Sudoku property or does it not have the Sudoku property? You can repeat digits. You can repeat. Does each box have to fill, be filled in or do you just put like a one place on the bottom? Right, just a ones place, then zero. put the zero in the tens. Yeah, so then put the all right, cool. Let's, let's try it. But first, I would just like for some folks to describe their solution strategy, and before that, just some estimates. How many combinations can we make? Even if you didn't get there, what, what are some ideas of, of numbers of combinations? How many do we think we got? Okay, so we got 84 is a potential. Anyone get something different than that? That's, which is fine. 76. 76. Others. Estimates, even if you don't have a calculation done. Does anyone think it's more than 84? Anyone think it's less than 76? Okay, so we've got a target. Notice that we don't have very many numbers up on the board. Now imagine how many numbers we would have had if I had asked for us to make a prediction and an estimate before we did any number crunching, right? If, if instead of just giving you the problem directly, I had asked, what do you, how many combinations do you think there are? If I hadn't even put that question up there, if I had just gone with what you had said and said, let's fill in the digits, no text here, start filling in digits, but before you fill in digits, how many do you think we can make? We would have had a lot more guesses, right? We would have had, like people wouldn't have felt like, oh shoot, I didn't get done, I don't know exactly how many there are right now. I don't know exactly how many there are either. I, I did this problem a long time ago and I forgot. Um, but, <laughs> But, that, but, that's, but that's fine because what, I, what I'm, I'm talking more about the design of the task, not actually getting to the answer right now. Like, I'm interested in how we phrase our questions, how we, sh what order we do our thing in. Like, um, there's a guy online, how many people, this is a high school thing, so I understand if you haven't heard of him, Dan Meyer. Any Dan Meyer fans? Okay, so we've got like three or four folks. Dan Meyer is, is I love this guy because he cares so much about the ordering, the sequencing, getting the most. He likes to squeeze the most juice out of every problem. And so like this problem, there's a lot of juice to squeeze, but if I don't take advantage of the fact that it's an interesting question how many combinations there are. But if I don't start with getting everyone to think about that from the naive point of like, I don't know anything about this problem yet, I haven't started finding patterns, that, that initial curiosity is lost. 
And, and then some of my students are gonna disengage because they're gonna be like, oh shoot, I gotta do all these subtractions and maybe I don't have all my like subtractions memorized, like what the heck is, you know, nine minus three, I don't remember. <laughs> like, then it becomes the whole mission, right? Um, but it's an interesting question, problem, this purposeful practice is people are practicing their subtraction facts even though that's not really the question, right? So the, you're, you're practicing some facts that you, we want our students to get fluent with, but if we just gave them a sheet with 50 subtraction problems on it, you know that some students' heads are going down. But with this one, especially if I had done a little differently, especially if I had gotten the estimates in the beginning and there had been like a wider range of numbers, and some of the students that had said like, oh, there's probably like five, and they hear someone say there's 100, like, there's 100? Why are there a hundred, right? Like, that's weird. And then, well, there's no way I'm gonna sit here and find all a hundred of them, so, so how can I get them faster? Is there some trick to this problem, right? And so then, now, now I am interested in some of the tricks that folks found. Um, so I would like to start with this 84. It sounded somewhat confident. Do you have a strategy that comes with this number? I did, but I kind of see what 76. Oh, interesting. Oh, wow, this is a whole, you guys are talking a whole language I don't even know. <laughs> this, I was trying to pull back from like, we're in a special group and just like, I, I just want to know what you did. Like, <laughs> well, I have my ones column and my tens column. Okay, there's a ones column and a tens and column. And what I did in each of them um, is I did it the long way. Um, I know there's probably a shorter way, but I, I'm not awake. That's fine. No, it's fine. Um, in my, in my um, ones column, I just did all the combinations of getting the three. So I did nine minus six, eight so minus five. So this is the five. ones, and this is the tens. And you found all the combinations that ended in three? Um, all the way down to three minus one, zero. Oh, okay. okay. So it started with nine minus six. So you had something like this. Uh, eight minus five, right? Mm -hmm. And all the way down. Wait, this is a three. Uh, this is a two, and this is a. So you did something like this. Oh, to three minus zero, right? That, okay. And nope. then I had three others, or one, two, three, four others that would involve in borrowing one from ten. So in that same ones column, I have, and I separated them. I have a zero minus three. Uh -huh. I don't understand. No, no, I, I, borrow. Uh -huh. I have a zero minus seven. Oh, oh okay, you're borrowing. I'm borrowing. And so it's going to become a ten. Right. So, okay. So seven. Okay. Uh, one minus eight. Uh -huh. So this is borrowing a one. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. And the, the last I could possibly borrow is two. So two minus nine because I can't go beyond the nine. Okay. Which means I can only use certain ones from the tens column. For, the, for this pattern. Yes. And in this pattern, it what doesn't matter. You I can, can use have all these combinations <coughs> or whatever. I it about could be tens. nine, like, okay. It could be whatever three minus whatever is zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it would be isolated in its column. Mm -hmm. So in the tens column, I just started with nine minus seven. Uh -huh. And I went down to... To make two, okay. Right. I went all the way down to two minus zero. Four, three, two. Okay. Are there any restrictions on these? No. Okay. So I used the probability thinking where you multiply the number of possibilities on the left and the number of possibilities on the right. So I did um, eight on the left. Okay, there's eight here. And then seven on the right. This up here? Yeah, those top ones. Yeah. And that gives me 56 possibilities. Okay, so you're saying I'm making the ones on the bottom. Yeah. The bottom well, I, the, I'll be doing them separately. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused, I okay. guess. I, I think so I know I've, what you're doing. I've, so far, I'm up to 56. Okay. 
So you've got eight times seven ways to make, you're doing this set? So far, we don't have the borrowing. So no so borrowing. No restrictions. Now, if I Got borrow, I cannot borrow from the two minus zero because that would not give me a two. Right. Um, Can we say that again? <laughs> on, the le on the tenths column. <coughs> yeah. You can't use the two minus zero. Because the two minus zero on the bottom of that list on the left, yeah, that cannot be included with my borrowing set. Uh, okay. Okay. If I borrowed one, I would not. And with the result of two. Yep. So I yep. eliminate that bottom one. Yep. Okay. So that could be, okay. So Are there that any leaves others? me eight left in the possibility. So this works with borrowing? Seven from the five. Seven left. Um, yeah. yeah. Like that, that's this kind of thing, right? Yes. I just want to make sure I'm following. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this would be like this. And how am I, and then over here I'd be borrowing like with a zero and a seven? Just, just so I'm following, so that would be this and this. And when I do the subtraction, I'm going to borrow, ten is going to work, and this is So I'm going to revise my answer. Oh. Not 84, I'm going to go 80, 56 plus 3, I'm going to go up to 59. 56 plus? Okay, so if you take... Okay, wait, let's not do all the thinking right here. Let's, I, 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 so I don't care about the answer, right? I don't even know it. And, and like, that's not the part that I think everyone is interested in. I think you're interested in getting to the right answer, and I appreciate that. But what I wanna share and what I want folks to think about is your approach, right? So if, if we keep going, now we're in the nitty gritty. And if we keep going down in the nitty gritty, I know I'm gonna lose people. I probably have already lost some people. You know, someone's checking Instagram under the table. <laughs> for sure. So, so even though I value you and I want you, Debbie, to get to the answer, I know you're grappling with it, I also have to be respectful of the whole class, right? And the fact that I, if I keep attending to this now, I'm gonna lose some folks. And so now I have a choice as a teacher. It's like, what do I do? Like, how do I get myself out of this hole that I'm digging myself into? And so I'm gonna pull myself out by saying, I, I appreciate this line of reasoning. And I think a lot of folks have followed it. And okay, we're gonna get to some borrows and we're gonna, I wanna hear, was there a different approach? I just wanna now hear there's a different approach. I value this approach. I think we'll get to the answer. I really do think we're gonna get there from here. Um, is there a different approach? Did someone try something else to get to the, yeah. Okay, I don't know if it's right, but. That's okay. fine, that's even better. I'm okay. gonna go over here. So, if it's okay. okay. Is it, it does it build off of what that was? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay so the biggest number we could start with was 99. Okay. So I did um, 99 minus 76 uh -huh. was the biggest way, the first way I could start getting to 23. Sure. So then I was like, okay, so then if I lower the top number yeah. by one, get 98, and yeah. then lower the second number to 75. Okay. Get 23. And I kept going with it. So then I went to 97, 96, 95, yeah. 94, 93, 92. And then I was like, okay, why am I doing this? I was like, I can just pretty much <laughs> go all the way to and keep getting 23. So I was like, there has to be 99 ways Ooh. to get this. Okay. So there's 99 combinations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see this. <laughs> Just keep going. Oh, I won't get negative because that top number is always going to be bigger than the bottom number. Top number is always going to be bigger. 99 of them, meaning that at some point you have a 1 minus... No, I won't because the top number... Oh, no, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so then it'll be 23 minus 0, so 99 minus 23. Oh, okay. I see that. 23 so minus zero. 76 combinations. How'd you get 76 so fast? <laughs> oh, 99 minus 23? I could just do that? <laughs> That's crazy, though. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, is that the repeat digit thing? Yes. yes. And we, I see up here, that's zero. 
Yeah, well, it says zero. Zero count as one. <laughs> okay, well, we can agree as a class, right? Like, if we decide we want to change some of the rules, we can change well, some of the rules. Yeah. But I think zero is included according yeah. to the instructions yeah. now. And then there were the repeat digit question was asked, yeah. right? So Not we're good. That's a good question because that's clarifying some of the assumptions that we've okay. made. Right? We've made some assumptions. <laughs> And, and so this is the way you count, is it inclusive? I always mess this up, you know, like sometimes it's off by one. Does it, is this one of those ones where, I don't know, is this one of those ones where I have, someone in here knows we're a bunch of math teachers. What's the question? I, I, okay, I don't know if, so um, if I'm counting all this set of things that I haven't actually listed everything, but I know that there's, 99 and it's going by one every time and it ends at 23. When I figure out how many there are total, it, do I subtract and, and add one or subtract one or do I just subtract? <laughs> okay. This reminds me of an episode of Curious George. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm not sure. You have to decide if you count the, when you take a step, is that one or is that zero? Yeah, this is that one zero thing. <laughs> Robin, you're a mathematician. This is right. <laughs> I actually would have to write them all down. I did the exact same thing. Um, you know what I do? I, I start with a small example and just What's make sure. Your, uh, Julia. Julia. Just make sure that this works. All right, so if I'm going to there, three, four, five. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, it's 77. All right. I, I, don't, I honestly didn't know, but I just found out. All right, so, okay, so this, and then we add one because we're like including the zero, right? And it was like, the, really. That gave us everything between one and 99. Okay. But okay, so that's, that's 77, is that awful? Yeah. That seemed, that seemed a little easier to follow, but I think this will get us there too. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm not gonna do it for the sake of time. But, <laughs> but if, now I'm sure there's probably another strategy, but for the sake of time, I'm also gonna stop there. I think two strategies is nice. Like sometimes the common core folks are like, do all six ways of multiplying <laughs> and like spend two weeks, spend two weeks on it. And like by the end of it, you've got kids going like, we're still multiplying. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make a comment that I, I do kind of see the connection. Like you were, it was the same thing. Yeah, I see. I see a connection too. It's like the structure is different, but I don't know. Can you explain the connection that you're seeing? <laughs> <laughs> the tens are going. The, the ones are going down by one, yeah. and the tens are going down by one, just like the are going down by one. Yes. One. Yes. Okay. Yes. Valid. She's just doing the place She's just doing the all the all the positive. Right. I think this, sim this simplifies the whole borrowing thing, right? By doing it that way, it, which is nice. Um, okay, so, so let's just talk about this task real quick. I mean, so folks, reflections on this concept, one, purposeful practice, two, this idea of like sharing multiple strategies. I think they want us to connect, connect the strategies, what Robin just has reminded us, connect multiple strategies. Any just reflections on these these teaching concepts, this pedagogical idea, I guess. Um, like yeah. For me, one thing about this is like we went to a lot of trainings about number sense for our students because they, they really lack number sense and how like we complain that they don't know how to multiply or they're lacking all the basic number sense and like how to build it into our curriculum. So we went to a lot of trainings on like how to incorporate number sense activities that were kind of like fun for the kids. So like when I saw this, I was like, this kind of falls in with that. Yeah. It sounds to me like it's a real similar thing. And did they give you a pack of problems? Because I want Yeah, they did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Juliet. Yeah, thanks for having your sign out. Too. Um, other, other thoughts, anything that makes you think? I mean, it's really, it's, it's useful to share out. Yeah? You know you mentioned in the beginning about the major jurors? Struggle, which I experience all the time. Yeah. Is there a way we could make something similar to this where integers um, become the thing? Right. To practice because they seem to forget, yeah. to add, subtract. Yeah, and this is and this is where the creativity and task design 
kind of comes into play. And, and really, teachers are the best at this work, but we're not given the time or space to do this work. But we're the best suited for it. What can we do? There was the question about, can we use negative numbers? Like, that was a great question, and, and we could, right? So we could just extend it. Let's use negative numbers. You can get some integers that way. And there's a resource I'm gonna be talking about, and I'm gonna plug it right now. It's called Open Middle. Have you tried Open Middle? Open Middle, if you don't take anything away from this today, Open Middle is a place to go because they have a bunch of problems like these submitted by teachers, for teachers. It's not like made by some publishing people. It's like pe teachers that use them in their class are trying them out and posting them online. And uh, they're all there, free to use. So Open Middle, um, it's probably like openmiddle.com or something like that, but anyway, it has problems like these. And, and then they are categorized. So to your question, there'll be some like integer stuff. But it's a good point. Like, I, th that's a question I have too. It's like, how can we get more purposeful practice in our class? Because I, yeah, I do it too. I give the kids worksheets. You know, like, you have to do it. Like, you need to practice some of these skills. And that's the only way is by repeating it. It's just like any other skill. Um, but it, it's nice, right, when you have something that's a little more interesting, a little more engaging, that still gets to practice. Yeah. I think the important part is the uh, the inclusion of, cu of curiosity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, because the curiosity drives these other questions. Well, yeah. can I use negative numbers? Right. Uh, what other limitations are there on this range of? Yeah. Oh, a range. Yeah. Well, there's a range of possible numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think including including that curiosity is important. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. So thank you, Chris. That's what we're looking for, right? So it's not that any of us have that answer, but together the teaching community, which is like a huge, vast network, I'm kind of like a. I don't know, like a DJ of the math education world. Like I, f I find videos that I think are amazing and I'm like, I have to share this with people. I don't know if you're gonna be interested in it or not. So like, this is gonna be my first attempt at sharing with you a video that you may be like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, but, but to me, this was like, this video almost like changed my life. It was so like interesting to me what he was talking about. So this is Dan Meyer, if you don't know him, and I, we'll see if I got volume in everything. I heard two ideas. One was about embarrassment. So this group here, I, was, I heard talking about embarrassment, and that, that, uh, that is a powerful motivator for a lot of students. The idea that I don't want to be uh, held back, or that one student in my social circle who was you know, off grade level who couldn't pass that class. Um, there's a certain embarrassment that teachers can and do exploit to try to encourage kids to learn more. You know, like, like do you want to see me next year? I don't want to see you next year. Stick around. Uh, that, that's one idea of social need. Or like, if you want me to call home and get you in trouble with your parents, is another one. Like, come up here and like tell your mom what you're up to right now. <laughs> Why you can't get it together is another example of social need. Uh, graduation also. And then table two is talking about uh, 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 jobs, like that being an economic need. Like I hear you talking all the time uh, about wanting to become an engineer or a doctor. Like you know you're gonna need a, a good college degree for that. Like get it together. Let's work on this right here, right now. It's economic need. Uh, or do you want do you want to have any job or go to any college? Like you've got to do better in class here. That's economic need, and, and none of them, none of, neither one of those is like is, is bad on its face, but they're very ineffective. I found with students that we most most need some kind of need. So I walked in as a new teacher and they gave me the kids that uh, no one else wanted to teach. Obviously, it's how we treat new teachers, right? And so I was teaching the kids that had that I learned really fast lacked social and economic need. And coincidentally, the things that motivated me most as a math student, as a kid, were social and economic need. Like, I love when my teachers were happy with me, my parents were happy with me, that I got good grades, and was in college. Like, I, that, that all motivated me. So I come into this class with a satchel full of motivators, none of which were effective at all. Like, I got laughed at at the threat to call home because the kids knew what I didn't know, that the number in, in, this, in the SIS I was like, wasn't current. The last five years or so, so like I, I was, I, I was completely declawed, defense, right? And that, and, and the idea of, of a job for these fourteen-year-olds was just like a little too abstract. But they were just, this was not on their mind. Um, so that, that's why this idea of intellectual need was so powerful. And we offered a third way out that uh, is truer to mathematics, less external to math, also. So here's the question I ask myself: Is one, why did some mathematician invent this concept, and can I put students in that place? just for a moment. And what that required you to do is to imagine that every skill you teach students or concept was invented by a mathematician for a reason, for a felt need. And not because that mathematician uh, is cruel and angry and wants to punish your students hundreds of years later. That is not how this went down. 
This right here, as a matter of fact, is, uh, is not actually a mathematician. This is uh, the eighth US president, Martin Van Buren. But you didn't know that because this totally fits your mental model of a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, angry with you. Right? This is your mental model of mathematician. But you gotta throw that away and assume that these are just uh, innocuous, harmless creatures in competition. And they had some felt need to invent this math. We had to figure out why that is and we do translate this for a moment. Also, if this is aspirin, if this, if this math is aspirin, then what is the headache and how do I create it? So that's his thing. That's like his thing. And then, but I want to show you some of these interesting, and I'm not going to play the whole video, but to a neighbor, so he talks about different needs. You believed at one point and what you actually This video is amazing. There's a link to it if you actually have an hour. I, got I doubt you really will, but. Okay, so here it is. Um, <laughs> here's the But he, he, he shows these things where, like, why do we even have numbers in the first place? Like. You know, young children learning numbers, they hate that. Like, I mean, I would too when I was one young children. I'm sure I didn't want to learn my numbers, right? But like, but Dan Meyer gives you a reason to learn your numbers because he's like, here, try to count how much money is in this thing. And, and it's like, you estimate, and it's kind of fun, and like, you don't know, and people are off. And he gets people to get closer and closer to the guess by restructuring the numbers. So then he shows you another video and like you have a little more sense of what's going on, then he, he structures it more into a raise, and so now all of a sudden people's guesses are getting closer to how much there is. And and like doing that with students is interesting because then they like, oh, this is actually kind of useful. Like I could count all that money real quick. So there's there's a need for it instead of hey you got it one two three four five isn't just a list of things you memorize. There's like numbers there. Let's count them. Like it. It's hard to get a student to want to do that, right? Um, so he's got these ideas of need, and I think it's a brilliant, brilliant presentation. He does this thing where he's like, why do we combine like terms? I know any algebra teacher in this room knows combining like terms is like in your mind is like, come on, that's we know how to do this, but then you have so many students that are just mixing up. But why would you do that? And you're, you're just, apples and oranges, man. This is not even close. But but you can't say that. You can't say that because you know that it's hard to learn it. But like in your mind, you're like, ah, how is it so hard? But then he does this cool thing where he's like, here, evaluate this for some numbers. And so that's nice because it gets people to remember what exponents are. I mean, the elementary teachers, I don't think you teach exponents, so I don't expect you to know it. But like, he gets people to do this, and then he gives them something like crazy to do. Right, free. He's like, okay, free. now do evaluate those. Okay, yeah, yeah. Friendly now do this, language. and it's like, oh man, like mm -hmm. you're there evaluating it, and the algebra teachers because he's got a mixed group too. The algebra teachers in the room are like done. You know, they just combine the like terms and they're like, simple, done. But, you know, you got elementary teachers like filling in and evaluating, and I, and I understand that. And like the students would be doing that too. And, and then it, it's like, wait, how did that algebra teacher get that so fast? What the heck? And, and like, and they all cancel out. It's, it's even better, they cancel all out. So it's like, the answer is just blare, like blaringly there is like zero. You know, everyone's getting zero. And you're like, how is that zero? What the heck? I'm still multiplying five times four. You know? So that's interesting, right? Like the way he set it up. So anyway, I just want to share, I think it's a gem of a video. It's only been watched, you know, 3,800 times. That's, that's like, a, that's, I don't know, that's like a human problem. Like this should be in the millions, like the latest Wheezy album or something like that. But people need to watch this thing. It, it's really big, you know, like one more I just have to share because he puts them all on blast. He, he has the, well, first, I know everyone's seen this thing, the, uh, this was the Facebook viral thing about Common Core. I don't know if everyone's seen this thing. But what, what he calls out, the problem with this is like, the, this question does not require a, like, a mental model for subtraction that yes, Common Core is pushing that actually makes sense in a lot of ways, but not for this problem. This problem is like, yo, everything just subtracts, no borrowing. This is an easy subtraction problem. Why would you have him do all that, right? So even as math teachers, we know that's not a good problem. But Dan Meyer's like, look, the method and everything that the teacher's asking him to do, that would be great if the problem was like, you know, so if the problem was like, yeah, yeah, man. Prescribed methods. Like not say do it this way on homework. In class, sure, but on homework, 
you run into trouble that way. Or to make sure that you uh, uh, give the parent a nail for which their old tool is ineffective. And then that new tool feels more effective. It feels like pain relief, feels like power and not punishment. That's the idea. So, uh, so instead of this right here, we can offer a problem where there's like this problem. This is a great problem because now instead of like me doing the algorithm, which is gonna take me all this time, I could just be like, hey, look, if I take two and put it there, it's 400 minus 100, and the answer is 300. And like you would need to have number sense and number fluency to see that you could just do that rather than doing the whole subtraction out right here, which would be a mission. But it's, it's like you gotta give the right problem to get that kind of thinking to actually be necessary. And so that, it's just, he really thinks about this stuff. One more, I just have to, it's too good. He puts them on blast. Got in faith and know that we're all behind you, including me. And that he has the teachers pick a point. He's one teacher pick a point and another teacher try to understand where the point is. But in the, so the first teacher's like, oh, bottom left hand corner. And he goes, okay. But then he, he changes the grid on them. He puts more points onto the, on the thing in between. So now it's like, wait, bottom left hand corner, which one is it? <laughs> And so he's like, how confident are you? And he's like, oh, I'm not that confident. So then she keeps describing where the point is closer and closer until the other teacher's like, oh, I, uh, I'm eight out of 10 sure that, I, that it's right. And then she's still wrong, you know, she still comes to the wrong point. And then he, he flips it and he has the other teacher do it and he puts the coordinate grid up, you know? And it's like, well, okay, now, of course I'm gonna know where the point is, right? And so it, it's like, why do we need this thing? Well, now we can precisely tell where stuff is on the, on the plane. Um, and it's like a game, he almost gamifies it. So anyway, I just, I had to share it. This stuff is, is amazing. And so he talks about these needs and, and I'm just gonna glance over this. You need, need for certainty, like, I want to really know how many of those there are. Like, is it 77, is it 76, is it 84? There's this need for certainty that happens only when, um, and I, I'll put it bigger because someone take a picture, and I, I want to get on Twitter. <laughs> uh, no, but only when I'm curious. I mean, like, that's so important, right? Like, I'm not gonna have a need for certainty when you just give me a problem on the board I don't care about. But if somehow I get engaged by it, I made a guess. That guessing, it, it plays a big role. Like I didn't do it, but I pointed out that I should have, right? I should have done it because I think it would have got people more engaged. And like, I didn't think of it honestly until halfway through, I was like, oh, I forgot to do that. Um, and, and I think it's important. And then like, why is such and such happening? Like when you show something really curious, right? It's like, you wanna know why, you wanna know how. We're humans, we, we are naturally curious. So we try and tap into that, like what's causing that? Why is that like that? Right, like that graph that we were looking in the morning, it's like, why is it that those socio, lower socioeconomic, I mean, I think I know why, right? But then even if you're at the same socioeconomic and some people are doing better than others, like why is that, right? There's like this causal need that we all were feeling and, we, and we're in it and we wanna help it. We wanna help to make it better, right? And so like, there's so much need there. Um, Computation is not my favorite thing, but I guess sometimes there is a need for it. Um, but communication is really important. Sometimes like, I love those tasks where we have students describe to each other um, you know, what they see or how, it, how it's changing and their language isn't specific enough. So they realize, oh, I need the vocabulary to be able to tell my partner how this is doing things. Um, so that's great. And then, of course, the connection, the, the connections between the ideas and that structure. Um, we start to want to understand, like, how are those things connected? Um, so that, that's valuable. So then I've got some resources, and this is going to be like drive-by resources. Um, this, guy, uh, this guy did a bunch of curriculum maps for grades three, so sorry for people that are lower than three, through high school stuff. Um, and if you go to one of these, so I'm just gonna jump into this grade four curriculum map. Um, it's sequenced by, he's designed the unit, and then for each of these units, so he's got the units for grade four, and for each of the units, he's got the standards, and then he's got tasks. So these are tasks that you could use, and they come from different places, and TM, and Rich, Illustrated Math. He's got tasks for each unit, right? So for each unit, there's tasks, right? So it's a bunch of tasks, 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 tasks. All right, so, that's this guy, Jeff, problem-based curriculum maps. Again, we'll share the slides. Um, and I'm gonna keep 
going through some stuff. So I talked about intro tasks. That's that thing you want to get the hook. So a hook, Dan Meyer does his three-act tasks. I'm not going to show this video. Um, where he does a big reveal at the end. Like the, the, it's kind of like, oh, how many toothpicks are in this thing? And he like does some video. And then, and then there's a big reveal at the end after they've done all the math. Right? Um, and he got them engaged with his video. Um, and so the way he formats that is like, he asks, what do you notice? What do you wonder? What questions do you have? To a thing that he shows to his students. What information do we need to, to answer that question that you've come up with on your own? Then he shows them another clip after that gives them more information. And now it gives them time to compute. And then he reveals at the end to resolve that dissonance they had of like, am I right, am I wrong, was my estimate close? So that's his thing. I got a link to his three acts. I also have a link to, at the top here, I think it's at the top here. Uh oh Well, I'll send it if I don't have it. There's a, there's a whole site that has all this stuff. Anyway, um, it's like, over and over again, there's lists and lists of this stuff. I just don't want you to have to pour through a list of stuff. Even my slides is a list of stuff. Um, and so I'm trying to like limit it to the, what I think is important. Um, this guy, Robert Kaplinski, is from U UCLA, math coach. Bruins. What's that? Go Bruins. Oh, yeah, Go Bruins. Um, and he's, he's great. Uh, he works with Open Middle. This is his worksheet. I just want to point out how he is valuing effort, not correctness. He's saying, here's your first attempt. Just give it a shot, right? And what did you learn from this attempt? How will your strategy change on your next attempt at the same problem? Right, so it's like you would, uh, approach that problem, like starting from 99 and doing 98, like that's, that's pretty brilliant. Like I didn't think to start from 99 and work my way down. It's like I started with something that worked, you know, like 33 minus 10, and then what else works? Okay, well, 43 minus 20, and I'm all over the place. Like, I didn't think to do that. So like, so my first attempt would have been something that wasn't so structured. And then I would be like, well, and of course, this is, takes training in your class to get oh, students yeah. to start doing this. And this, is, this is a whole thing to take on. But I'm just, it's pointed, putting it out there, it's like, that's interesting. Like, to actually be valuing the attempt rather than the correctness of the, of the answer. You're not going for the answer, he's going for, you get two out of two for your attempt, two out of two for your explanation. There's nothing about answer here, right? You try, and you explain your try. The more times you try, the more points you get. That, that's interesting, that's right? That's, that's very different from how most math classes are organized. Um, so that, and he shows them something intriguing, right? He shows them something like that problem that I started with, or now I'm gonna go through a bunch of these. There's this agree or disagree website. They have a bunch of little videos or things, and the students agree or disagree with the statement, right? Like, which one's gonna fill up first? It's a video with the hose going and that thing's going. The students are like, uh, the, the top one, the top one, no, the bottom, the bottom. Okay, you got it, now you've got like a math fight in your class, right? And like, there's, math fights are great. You're like, all right, yeah, but let's settle the dispute, and then you've done some math. Um, and it's a good way to start, like either a class or a unit to get, get engagement. I'm gonna be running through these. Um, which one doesn't belong? I don't know if people know this one. Yes. Great, you know, like any of them could be right. And so that's awesome. So you can't really be wrong unless you don't try, which is, as math teachers, we know that's the, the last thing is just please try, right? And so, you know, th this is really um, accessible. Like, and there's entry points everywhere. And like, if you give this to like a five-year-old, they could do it too. And they're gonna say stuff that you weren't even, you're like, well, and it's great, you know, like, oh, this one doesn't belong because it's upside down. It's, it's standing on its head, you know, like, oh, whoa, yeah, okay, that, that makes some sense. Yeah, that's perfect point. Uh, all right, so um, number talks, math talks, I know these have become really big. Um, stuff like this is interesting. It's like, which one of these is bigger? And then, like, don't, don't multiply, like, don't do the multiplication, just which one do you think is bigger? And then let's talk about your reasoning. And it doesn't really matter if you're right or wrong, which is what I like, the low stakes. It's like, you know, oh, that ended up being not the right way. That's fine, oh, it's like that. And so that, that's cool, I, I like the, that approach. Um, I'm just jumping through a few more here. This is math mistakes. Um, he puts up mistakes, it's got Michael Fenton. Um, and, then, and then we discuss them. Well, I, I love doing that with students, right? Putting up mistakes that students have made and discussing what the mistake is, not trying to put anyone on blast, you know, no name attached to it, but um, like it, it is a cause for, well, not only 
the fact that it's a mistake, but like what mistake did they make and why does that kind of make sense, right? Like, oh, that kind of makes sense. I can see why you would do that. Um, and, but, but then if I actually made this two, then this would not really work. And then like students kind of start to be able to explain why or why not, right? And then like, oh, but when it's equal to zero, that does make sense, and so that's why I did it. And anyway, you can like resolve some of the little bits of confusion when you share mistakes. I'm sure you all know that, but there's a whole website about it. Eureka um, does that. Eureka, Eureka has lessons on um, who is correct and tell me why, so it's the number sense talk. Yeah. And then the, the practice. That's awesome. So yeah, add that to the list. Eureka Math, that's the um, Engage New York, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have some good good stuff on, on all the topics too. The full curriculum, um, visual patterns. I mean, this is more of like maybe a upper grades thing, but there's a whole website dedicated to visual patterns, a, a whole lot of them. I wanted to talk about this guy's thing, but I didn't. Um, I didn't get this far, so it's not here. Uh, I'm just gonna just gonna at least make it visible. Um, but this guy. Uh, Again, Michael Fenton, he, he gave a talk. I have a link to it. Of course, no one has time to watch that, but it's at me. And, um, <laughs> but but it, um, he asked some interesting questions with his visual patterns that not everyone asks, so I, I just wanted to point those out. So if you do visual patterns in your class, I know I did, and I know I didn't ask some of these things. Um, he does what comes next after he does a second one, and then he says what else might come next. And so then the students are generating a bunch of different patterns instead of us just doing one pattern, which is really cool. Instead of showing them three and just expecting the one answer, he shows one, they grow, and then they grow different ways, and they have like multiple patterns coming on. I like that. And then he, he asked the what comes before. And then he asked like, what else might come before? So he's doing this thing that like, gets the students generating the patterns on their own, and thinking of patterns that you weren't necessarily a thought of. It's really cool talk. I didn't have time to like really summarize it for you all. Um, there's would you rather math. Would you rather was I think still kind of a common thing young people do. It's like a icebreaker in college or something. Um, and so they were using that more of a high school level thing. I think that website. Um, let's see. Play with your math. Like this is interesting. They have interesting questions like. Take it, split it up into as many pieces as you can, and then what's the biggest product you can make with those pieces? Well, this would all multiply to one, so this can't be the answer. That's an interesting question. Which one is gonna make the biggest product of the pieces? Such a weird thing to ask, and like students that don't like numbers might say, no, I don't like numbers, but at the same time, it might generate some curiosity. There's a lot of these on Play With Your Math. Um, Estimation 180, this is Andrew Stadel. Andrew, I don't know how to pronounce his name, it might be Stadel. Um, but he's on Twitter for all the elementary folks. He's awesome, like so many activities. Uh, and I'm, I'm running low on time, that's so sad. All right, so <laughs> I, 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 just, I just have a lot that I would love to share with you all. Um, of course, Desmos is really cool. Um, the, I'm sharing the slides with you all. Uh, I was gonna play this Marilyn Burns game with you all. I have a lot, I probably have like a six hour session here. Like, <laughs> um, uh, it, it's the first time I'm giving it, so I'm just kind of throwing everything in there. But um, <laughs> Mars tasks are really valuable. Um, WTF problems, I don't know who named them that. But, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but these WTF problems are cool because like, these points are all on the same line, but you don't know that at first, and so you're asked to calculate the slope between any two of them, and everyone's getting the same slope, and then you're like, well, why, what? Why is everyone getting the same slope? How could that be? Are they parallel? Is it on the same line? Anyway, it's interesting. So what do you tell the kids WTF stands for? Well, I mean, I'm just calling them that for you all. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> problems that make you say that are WTF problems. The students will say, you know, might say that, but they might say something else. Um, this, this is an interesting thing to get people to walk around, like put the points on, on name tags instead. And then I had an activity planned about opening up questions. That's really was the thrust of this thing, I should have done it earlier. Um, how can I do this in a minute? I don't think I can. So, so I'm just gonna say, um, please, Take a look at the slides. There's another webinar, hour long, don't have to watch it, but I have a link to the materials that he only gave the people who watched it. So if you want the materials, you can do that. And, um, and then it, it's interesting 
opening up questions, which I really should change this talk and make it just these slides, um, is, is really important, I think, because some of these techniques uh, really make the problems richer. Um, so in, instead of giving a, a general fraction problem where like, I have two fractions, I'm adding them, I start with the answer. Like, two fractions add to one half. What could they be? Well, now there's a bunch of answers that could happen, right? And so then my class can generate those answers, and we can talk about what's similar about those answers. And you can do that with a lot of things. You just start with the, start with the answer, and then reverse the question. Um, the solution to a two-step equation is x equals four. Well, what could the original equation be? Well, there's a lot of answers to what that could be. And so that's fun, like, it's more interesting. It doesn't just have, yeah. oh, I gotta get the right answer, you know? And everyone's answer could be right. Let's see if that's right. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of examples on here. I'm, of course, out of time. Uh, but if you just take one thing from the top, open middle, this place is great. It has a bunch of these types of problems that we're talking about where students can practice fluency with stuff. A lot of these are like Sudoku style, where you can only use the digit once. And so it's like use the digits one through nine and most once. Create an equation so the solution is closest to zero. And like, that's interesting. How do I, how do I get that to happen, right? They just, now all of a sudden I'm playing with my algebraic inverse operations like for a long time, you know? I just done like, I just did like a 15 problem worksheet with one question. So that's a really cool site. It's broken down by grade level. If you don't take anything, that's the one. It's slide 58. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's a, that's my time. Are there any questions before I close? Yeah. What are your thoughts on homework? Uh, th that's a good one. I've I've gone in a lot of debates with a professor, Alan Kinnear at Occidental, about homework. There's, there's studies that say that homework is valuable, um, and I, I I honestly, in my school setting, gave homework very sparingly. I gave homework like once a week, um, but. Um, that, that was me, and that was where I was at. My students just didn't do it. And I was high school with, and I was teaching like, quote unquote, demo geometry, and the ninth graders that no one wanted, and I love those kids, but they did not want to do any homework. Um, and if I gave it, it ended up being like a copy fest before class, you know? So like, I don't want to promote that. Um, so like, if I'm getting a copy fest, well, I could call the parents and tell them, and then it's still, it's the same situation. So I was like, well, I'm just gonna give less. But if I can find a way to give homework that my students will do, that's great. And if I could give them a problem that's like kind of open-ended, then I don't have to give them 20, right? Like if I could just give them a couple of these that like takes them a while, and of course, takes them a while to just talk to them, hey, you did it already, all right. But like, and I know it's gonna happen, right? Like with homework, that happens a lot. And so that was my big issue with homework. It was just like this ethical thing. It was like, I don't really want to promote that type of, and I mean, I was that kid in high, in high school that everyone copied off of, and I, and I was the one that was stealing everyone else's opportunity to learn by giving them answers, you know? So I know I was that guy, and I, I don't want to make more of that. Uh, so, so that's my thoughts on homework, but I, I think it can work, right, if the students do it.